Hello and welcome to Data Expresso, a podcast for data professionals who want to build their career around data, analytics and technology. I'm Eva Murray, a data-loving, bread-baking runner based in London. And I'm Helena Schwenk, a swimmer, dog lover and keen traveller. Together, we lead tech evangelism at Exasol and we're here to talk all things data. This podcast brings you fresh insights and stories from the world of analytics. So grab your favorite drink, sit back and join us for new stories from the world of data. Welcome to this second episode of Data Expresso, where we continue to explore the theme of data leadership and what it means. Now, today's topic, we'll be talking about contrasts in leadership style, differences in approaches. You could say the yin and yang of data-driven leadership uh, that discusses both the hard data side as well as the human side. So what we found is that the crisis has really put a lot of pressure on organizations to make decisions a lot faster. And for many of us, that has become the new normal, as, as we all tend to call it. And it really hasn't come a moment too soon because a lot of us think, why hasn't it always been that way? Why haven't we made decisions at this pace for a long time? And I think when it comes to leaders, really, we need to have that balance or find that balance between making faster decisions, but also leading with empathy. And I think there's a real struggle in there because, or a potential for struggle, because you have that pressure to make the decisions. But as soon as we come under pressure and feel that stress, the empathy can go out the window and we can, you know, kind of snap at people or just not be as considerate in our interpersonal interactions. Um, but then they also, you know, there's this constant consideration of, well, we're living in a pandemic, we're living in a global crisis, what are actually the impacts on people's personal lives, their financial circumstances, their emotional well-being um, on an ongoing basis, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, I definitely think there's a lot of considerations, a lot of factors to pay, you know, some, for instance, may be afraid of coming back to work. <laughs> Yeah. Others may not, you know, managing family life and work life and juggling the two at home um, puts a lot of people under pressure. Um, and some may be worried about job security. I think that's a, a very real um, uh, situation for many. So there's a lot of considerations at, at play here. Definitely. And from what I've observed is that our personal lives have never been so visible in a work context and have never had as much, I guess, power to influence others and to show them that, hey, beyond being workers, we're also humans, we're people, we're family people, we're friends, we're, we're, we're mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and, 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 and children of people who also need to have these relationships. And I think that's really come to the surface a lot more. Um, and then, so we have that personal side, but their leaders fa face these additional challenges because there is a lot of companies are experiencing a lot of economical headwind. They might not be able to invest in new technologies. They might not be able to grow as much as they expected. In, in fact, they might actually have to, you know, completely change their plans and downsize a bit uh, just to kind of go through uh, this crisis unharmed um, and and freeze the hiring processes to make sure that they can first re-establish their financial security before they really go any further. Yeah, sure. So um, I think it's really important. I think what we're, we're sort of emphasizing here is the need to focus on empathetic leadership, especially in uh, times of crisis. And I do know that numerous studies show that in a sort of business as usual environment, when you show these traits, when you're a compassionate leader, um, they tend to perform better as leaders, but they also foster more loyalty and engagement from those that they are leading. Um, but I think all of these things, that's business as usual, all of these traits and characteristics are especially critical during um, a crisis. And I know we talked last week 
um, we've had some really good sort of examples of great leaders um, and how they're navigating the crisis. Um, but there are also some, I suppose, some practical implications uh, that we can take away from it that we're faced in everyday situations, for example. Yeah, and I think it's always important to, as we have these, you know, theoretical concepts and might be a bit abstract, to just break it down to, okay, what does this actually mean in everyday lives? And I would say, of course, empathy in general means showing that empathy to our employees, but also more more um, when it comes to the ecosystem we operate in in business it's who are our partners who are our customers who are our suppliers but also the the community the physical community we operate in the the city or town around us how are we being empathetic to what is actually happening and and then being available as leaders because in times of uncertainty even if we make a concerted effort to communicate clearly and transparently and um, and proactively so that people know what's going on sometimes they might want to actually approach us with an issue or a question and being available to give them answers or just to listen is really really important as is checking in with people regularly to see how they're doing because quite often we don't have the face-to-face -face interactions at the moment. So we can't necessarily spot something unless we deliberately go somewhere and, and, and talk to someone. Yeah, I think that's really important. And it's, you know, sometimes the, the, the more basic things that we should be doing. So asking questions um, and um, finding ways to su support people. Um, you know, start with the basics, you know, what are you feeling? <laughs> could be a good starting uh, place, you know, asking someone whether they need help to manage their time, for example. Uh, we know that there are um, complexities of working from home, although it does bring some benefit. If you've got other responsibilities, children or maybe elderly parents or whatever the situation is, having more flexible flexibility in your work schedule can make a huge difference um, I would definitely say yeah definitely I I've experienced it myself because some days I might need a bit more time in the morning just to get ready or to you know do a run clear my head and other days I roll out of bed and I think no I just I just want to do some work first and then do my exercise or whatever it might be and I think now working from home there is that flexibility and I take that for myself because I know what's coming. I know what my calendar looks like. So why not work it in a way that aligns with how I'm feeling that day or what other pressures I have, uh, you know, being put on me. So um, I think it's, my, it's good to be mindful of, you know, people might need different things, but those needs also change over time. Yeah. Um, and I think a common theme that we come back to is about communication and one aspect of that is being clear on the priorities for the organisations and employees working within that and also being clear and transparent about the journey that you're on and what's coming up, you know, what can people expect in terms of the impact on the business, you know, both now, in the future, will there be changes to the way the company operates, you know, may, more than likely in certain industries, there's going to be closures, there's going to be organisational restructuring, there's going to be changes in business models, this is all needs to be um, communicated in a, in a clear and transparent way really. There may be other impacts, you know, in terms of, you mentioned about hiring freezes, there may be less reliance on external consultants, for example, and that, and, and maybe uh, more reliance on employees themselves, that can have an impact. I do know one example, for instance, of a, of a global telco that in the early stages of the pandemic actually redeployed a thousand store employees to inside sales when those retail store outlets were sort of closing down and managed to retrain them within weeks. <laughs> Obviously a huge amount of change there, being able to um, enable uh, employees to understand and to be clear on the impact of those changes, I would imagine is key. 
And it's interesting that example that you bring because again, it shows they must have made decisions really quickly and not just the decision to retrain these employees, but then to actually roll that out and do that, which in the past maybe would have been a matter of months. Um, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly it gets compacted because the urgency is there. And I know that on the flip side, we can't constantly operate at this, you know, 100 miles an hour because at some point people will take shortcuts because they have to. And, you, you know, you can't really stabilize a business using shortcuts. But it's imp like it's really impressive to see how dynamic things can suddenly become, right? Yeah, sure. And this is definitely an area of interest for myself. I've done a lot of research at this and looking at some of the benefits that maybe can be drawn from uh, this environment where everything's moving at an accelerated space. What is the impact um, on the business? You know, why does sometimes doing things faster make uh, much more sense? And I think there's an, a number of ways that we're seeing benefits there. The first of which is definitely around accelerating those decision-making cycles. So as you say, the, the decision to redeploy those staff in, and retrain them within a matter of weeks, ordinarily that possibly would have taken months, if, if not a lot longer. Um, and there's, there's definitely, you know, when you're thinking about accelerating decision making, um, there is this thought of involving more people in that whole process. Now, we've seen is that faster decision making is actually linked to enabling more people to take part in making those decisions. Now, that may sound a bit counterintuitive. It did to me initially. So while bringing perhaps more people into a single decision may risk slowing things down, slowing the business down, I think the key point here is about empowering more people to make more decisions. So you're democratizing that sort of decision making capability. And this has uh, shown potential to significantly improve the speed of decision making. Yeah, I mean, what, what comes to mind, there's two things. On the one hand, you have this room full of people where if and a virtual room at right now, but maybe rather than making a decision with two or three people and then moving to the next stage and the next stage, you actually get everyone who, is, was ever, who was always going to make a decision, but you bring them in at the same time and say, end-to-end -end process looks like this. Here are the decisions we meet, need to make. And like you say, suddenly everyone who's relevant for that decision or who has, you know, who has a dependency, who has a role to play, can be part of it and you speed it up. And the other thing it reminds me of is, I think it was maybe during my time at Deloitte where we, you'd, we would maybe have a meeting or we have, you know, some kind of discussions amongst ourselves. And uh, some people would say, you know, a fast game is a good game. It's not about dwelling on things and maybe having a long drawn out discussion or story about, you know, how you came to this point. Rather, hey, let's just all kind of get on with it and get through this fairly quickly because then we can spend our time focusing on the next steps and the next value added part in the process rather than what happens sometimes in meetings where they get really drawn out and, and there's a lot of politics and maybe a lot of wasted time. And I think now people just don't have the luxury of time and they have yeah. to get to those decisions. I, I definitely think what this crisis and pandemic has shown is the ability to cut out time wasting activities and maybe to cut out bureaucracy where it's not um, needed to sort of reduce hierarchical thinking. I, I definitely think that this is uh, because of the need to move at speed, the need to move at pace. Um, there is um, definitely a rethinking of those organizational structures, you know, less about command and control style data-driven leadership, but more about empowering others within the organizations um, to, to, to make those decisions at the same time. Yeah, and I wonder how much simply that virtual setup has to do with it, because suddenly 
Mm-hmm. Everyone is working from home. And while there are different levels of home office, I suppose, there suddenly are no more corner offices and fancy views, but different styles of bookshelves behind people. And there's living rooms, there's kitchen tables. It makes, it, it certainly levels the playing field a bit where it becomes more collaborative from, at least from where I'm sitting. But I also wonder how much um, we learn from, you know, people at, who are at different stages in their lives. So maybe young parents who have to juggle all these things at once. I can't even imagine the demands on their time and sanity, but they only have so much availability between childcare, running the house and, and keeping their jobs going. And I think there's, there's just something to say about let's focus on what's, what's essential so that the right people can participate, but also we move on as a business. We prosper or at least we survive these times until things settle down until you know kids are back at school people can resume a more normal work schedule and um i mean i applaud people who juggle all of that um and who don't necessarily have the luxury of just closing the door and and you know working for eight hours so uh, yeah well kudos to all yeah. of those yeah i could definitely uh, res- that definitely resonates with me having this week said goodbye to my children and sent them to school (laughs) and feels quite strange um but i do have i'm still working at home and uh, i still have much the same structure of a working day but perhaps less pressure to do all of that juggling at the same time (laughs) yeah definitely now so so we've talked about that pace of decision making and i think we've identified a few kind of factors or influences on that and there's a big one of course for us and that's data and technology so you know we said some companies might have had budget freezes or they've been in a situation where initially they wanted to maybe invest in technology or they were considering investing in technology and suddenly they have to work with what they have but what if what if they're in an environment where or they have a data environment that isn't really up for the task what what could they do to work with the tools they have, but to still get that decision-making done and to still move their business forward efficiently? When I think about scalability, I think this has always been a major concern for uh, data professionals. But I'm, I suspect that as we move to a more digitalized version of our world that has been driven by the pandemic, then that is going to produce much far more data and therefore data scalability in a concern isn't going away any time soon. And I think the sort of net result of some of these challenges and obstacles is that you have performance bottlenecks in your sort of analytics and data infrastructure. And this later down the line can subsequently impact the speed at which you can make decisions at all levels of the organization. Definitely. And I think the the challenge that we're talking about is some organizations might be in this situation where you know we can't really invest but but we do need to invest or we do need to at least make some changes and maybe now is a time where you really pare down just to the bare minimum of what do you need to operate to survive to have minimum amount of growth and maybe that actually makes it clearer for them what would be the right level of scalability they need to achieve what would be the right level of investment the right type of technology so that once they can make the funds available or get the processes in place whichever it is they actually opt for the right solution because in the past with the luxury of time with the luxury of bigger budgets they may have gone for a solution that looked right on paper but didn't fully address their needs and now because the needs are so raw it might actually be a a better way to get to that right solution i'm I'm not sure, but it is something that I've been thinking about. And I wonder now, as the organizations work through this, so we've, we've had six months of crisis, basically, right? And we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if there's going to be a second wave, how winter is going to go in the Northern Hemisphere. But there are some organizations where things have stabilized and they're starting to re-emerge. They're, they've, they've figured out this new normal. They want to move forward. How are they going to handle scalability? But also, 
when we look at data and analytics, how can they use self-service or use this time to really establish self-service so that they come out better than they went into the crisis? Mm. So definitely lots of pressure on the technology and data infrastructure. Um, given over with some of the challenges that we've talked about around scalability. So how, how can organisations um, leverage what they have in a more efficient and effective way? And I definitely think self-service and tied in with the ability to empower many more people within your organisation to make a decision is uh, at a critical sort of crossroads. Um, you know, and there's definitely a, a much stronger focus on data and analytics to underpin decision making now more than ever. So to me, many have turned to self-service analytics, particularly in response to the pandemic, because they need answer to those really important uh, business questions. And the key thing about self-service analytics is it's enabling and empowering those data users, those data consumers to direct their own analytics uh, journeys. Um, now, um, it allows them to get answers when they need them, <laughs> not when someone has time to uh, uh, produce them. So it's all about reducing those bottlenecks. Um, and this is something, especially when you're under increased uh, time constraints or pressures to get pressures to get answers to questions, this is when it really comes into its own. But self-service is, uh, I suppose, a, a, a technology solution that can help reduce some of the friction that we see in helping and supporting faster uh, decision making. But we also understand, and we've spoken about this before, that that really needs to be paired with an understanding of how that data is actually serving you. What does this mean? Does that person who is involved in you know self-service and self-service analytics can they read and understand that data and convey meaning to others so we've definitely seen that a focus on data literacy as well as uh, a focus on education and training can um, increase the benefits of self-service analytics and like you say, I mean, there's a huge opportunity for it now because in a way you also need it because we can't just walk, you know, when I say we as analysts, you know, you can't just walk into a meeting room, have 20 people sitting there and present stuff. Sure, you could do it virtually, but it is a very different dynamic. And if people can instead be empowered to help themselves, then the analysts can spend their time not sharing and explaining data, but really analyzing data, finding more insights, supporting those really critical business decisions. And after a while, there's going to be a learning curve. First, people need to be taught how to use these self-service tools and how to find the right information and what the metrics mean and, you know, what is the definition for a, this business unit or this department. But after a while, it really means that they can help themselves, like you said, they can find things when they need them, not when someone else makes the time to help them. And they can really make data more part of their everyday life. And I think that's so important in the overall data-driven mission that so many organizations now have or claim to have. How can you become data-driven if your people don't use data? It's not going to work. So putting data in people's hands has to be the first step and empowering them to use it. Um, and then that you know come, goes in line with achieving that scalability to make sure that people don't just have access to it, but they have access to everything they need. It maintains its performance. They can, you know, they can, they can send their queries off and they get results in the, in the right time. Um, but the other side of the scalability question is, well, you might have added a bit of uh, additional capacity during crisis mode because of, you know, all this remote working, but those, workarounds or shortcuts were not really built for the long term and really we could think of it like 
it's a band-aid on a really bad cut and maybe instead of a band-aid long term you do need surgery or at least someone to you know stitch mm -hmm. up the wound um what, is there anything else that in terms of okay going from those short-term solutions to more long-term stable scalability there are bottlenecks along the data value chain um, and they don't just emanate as you imagine in the data layer but they also emanate within the sort of uh, data and query and self-service analytics layer as well so what's needed very much is um, if you if you are putting sort of band-aids as you've alluded to over parts of those is looking at a more sort of wholesale approach when you're in a better position and you have the resources uh, to do so to actually address what is going on within your data layer to reduce some of those um, key constraints those, those bottlenecks but to also look in conjunction with how they're surfaced and how they're delivered to those end users as well and I think what this crisis has shown really is that you know leaders very much have to be ready or they should be preparing really for the stress test on their data and analytics environment that will come sooner or later because as we've alluded to there is definitely a shift towards you know an increased pace in decision making and organizations are saying is that this is the way they expect to continue going forward so they're going to expect that same level of performance um, in the future but they're going to expect it as potentially that uh, system, that architecture scales and delivers insights to many more people and many more stakeholders within there. So it's about obviously working with the now, but focusing on what the architecture should look like in the longer term as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we'll see is that as our lives really stabilize, we're gonna have quite a lot of exciting opportunities to take the lessons that we've learned from the crisis and embed the new processes, the new ideas and those solutions deep into the business and say, this is the good that actually came out of it. And we're going to take that forward. And it's going to require quite a lot of, a lot of work, I would think, and dedication and effort, but it's going to be worth it because not only will it help us as, as a business world to reemerge from this crisis, but also to stabilize and to be stronger to, for the next crisis, because whether it's a pandemic or financial crisis or what, there will be more crises to come in the future. It's, it's not, not really something we can prevent, I guess. Um, and it can be transformative for the business. I think businesses can completely be reborn, a bit like Phoenix from the ashes. And um, if you are a data leader, you as our audience, um, it's going to come down to handling the challenge of the side of data-driven decision-making and making and managing that technology, but also at the very same time, coming back to our earlier point, nurturing people, doing that through empathetic leadership and managing their priorities and expectations and the stuff that also happens in their lives outside of their day job. So our recommendation to close this out are to have a clear plan of action, to communicate early, early and often, um, and to be very clear in your communications, to then involve the right people in decisions along the way. And lastly, to empower your stakeholders to access all the information they need and the insights that help them make those decisions. Yeah. What great insights and, and feedback to have. So thanks for downloading and listening to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode of Data Expresso, we would appreciate it if you could rate, review and subscribe and even better, share it with your network so we can reach more people. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter there. And finally, as always, feel free to connect with us on social media in the usual way.